Welcome to Interviews from Mexico. I'm Laura Carlson, and I'll be your host as we look at cutting-edge issues with the men and women who know them best, here on Telesur. In the year 2003, a fight for water rights came to a head in the indigenous village of San Pedro Talenisco in the state of Mexico. One person died and six villagers were sent to prison on the basis of inconclusive evidence. Now those six have become a symbol for the fight for water and land here in Mexico. We're talking today with the brother of one of those prisoners, Dominga Gonzalez. His name is Roberto Gonzalez, and he's also a leader in the defense of land and water from San Pedro Tlanisco. Roberto, thank you so much for being with us here today on Interviews from Mexico. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you, Laura, for allowing me to talk to an international audience so people can really understand, in my own words, how the indigenous communities suffered, in this case, under the repression from the government of the state of Mexico. Yes, well. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you with us, and I know that this is an emotional issue for you. Your sister has been in prison now for 15 years. If you could please tell us how this began, what happened, uh, in the fight for water that she ended up as a political prisoner. Laura, look, this conflict has been for a long time. There have been disputes, you could say, between two communities. In this case, it's not the community of Villa Guerrero, with the flower growers, the companies who came to this municipality where the community is, and the conflict started because the springs in our community, they come out of the earth in our ejido. And these companies started using them, the water. When we as a community try to use them, the government of the state of Mexico told us, you can't take that water, it's not yours. So they were actually taking the water of your own springs in your own village, were you already beginning to feel a scarcity of water when this began to happen? Yes, because uh, as I was saying, when our community wanted to use this water for domestic use, well, we wanted to build pipes and bring it to the community. And the government say we couldn't because in this case, a group of flower growers of Villa Guerrero had a concession, and we didn't. And it was at that time that the conflict started, because how could that be true if the springs come from our lands? Why can't we use them? And also, we were never going to take all of the water. We were only going to use what the community needed. Then, because they didn't let us use the water, the community started organizing with our practices and traditions as indigenous people, the rules that people who live in this situation have for organizing our communities. To say, you know what, we're going to organize, we're going to form a commission to say, why can't we have this water? If we had water in those times, we sometimes went 15 or 20 days without having a drop of water in our homes, in all of the houses. We didn't have water, we had to go to the springs, and we had to bring the water back in containers. The women, the housewives, well, to wash uh, our clothes or to bath, we had to go to the rivers to do the laundry, to get drinking water, to bring water to cook. So for everything, we had to go get the water ourselves, even, even though we have water and plenty of it. 
Now, who were these companies that were taking the, the water, and how did they get the support of the state government to leave an entire village without water in their homes? Well, the person who unfortunately died because well, we as human beings were sensitive to the fact that a human being died. Oh, let's stop for a minute and talk about what happened. This is the incident that took place in 2003 that resulted finally in the imprisonment of the six village members. How was it that he lost his life? I want to go back a little bit. I'll tell you a quick summary about how the conflict started and how it got mm -hmm. bigger and led to the unfortunate incident that happened. Look, when we realized that at that, what I was telling you, that we couldn't use our own water, the state government said, you can't take the water, it's not yours, doesn't belong to you. But at the same time, they gave us some concessions as people. And they also gave concessions for water used to Villa Guerrero, the flower growers. Mm -hmm. So they granted concessions to both the community and the flower growers from the exact same springs that were in dispute. Bling. It's like setting up a situation for conflict. Then when we were meeting with the government of the state of Mexico because there were delegations from our community and there were even people from the flower growers in those meetings. Well, we never reached an agreement because the men made fun of the people who came from our community. They call us names like, and excuse me, they call us Indians. They said we didn't have the right to take this water. So when really, we know that it was something anywhere in the world, we know that water is life. And this is mostly an indigenous village, Nahua indigenous people who live in San Pedro Tlanisco, right? It is an indigenous Nahuatl village, and from that point on, the conflict started escalating. And well, because we neither, no, neither the government nor anyone else was offering us a solution, we started fighting and saying, well, that this isn't yours, it's mine, not yours. Later, they brought a group of flower growers uh, to the cliff because the springs emerge at the cliff. Supposedly to check, saying that the water was dirty and they thought that we were contaminating, polluting the water and poisoning the water for their flowers. When actually our community just goes to the river to get water for our own consumption, to take it over, uh, to our houses. We wouldn't damage the water because that would also hurt us. When those guys went to the cliff, there's a path that we call Los Lavaderos, and that's where the housewives go to wash their clothes. And there's even a place that's uh, hidden where uh, women and children go to bath, so they, it's a little private. And they realized that these people were coming down to the river and the women went back to the community and rang the church bells. As it's a custom of the village that when the bells ring, the people gather. And I mean a lot of people, we're talking about more than 300 people, 400 people who go together to the community and they all went down to the river to ask the men what was going on, what they were going to do, asking them to explain why they were provoking the community, since we were that there was a conflict between them and us. They said that they were going to walk back up and talk to the community, and unfortunately, while climbing the cliff that's about 250 to 300 meters high, this man who it seemed to me was suffering from hypertension because of the altitude. There were four police officers. It will be hundreds of police cars. Hundreds of police cars from different police forces will come around the community. Supposedly to arrest the people who murdered this man. But unfortunately no one had murdered him. It was an accident. And I'll repeat it, we regret what happened as people who live here because it's a human life. But we didn't do it. It wasn't the people who, who are locked up 
they are innocent, but unfortunately they accuse them people without having the basis to say who it was. They just accuse them because that's what they were told. There are not even a declaration, there's nothing to prove it. As if I was saying, oh, you were. They don't know who it was, how they did it, no one knows about them. And we don't know either. No There's no clear story that says this is what happened. The government just jumped ring and said we're going to arrest these people. If it's these people, whether or not it's them, we're going to lock them up. And they took the leaders of the movement in defense of, of water. It was the people, the people who are in prison now, they are the people who before served as the representatives working for drinking water and they were members of the Hido communities. In this case, Pedro Sánchez Berrios Abel, Lorenzo Sánchez Berrios Abel, Teófilo Pérez, Marco Antonio Pérez, Romulo Arias, they were from the drinking water committee and Dominga González, my sister, was part of the Ejido committee. They had asked for an injunction to defend the water and they took her from there and threw her in jail. It's important to say their names and to not forget that they're among many political prisoners in Mexico today. Since that happened, after 15 years in prison, what has the community been doing to organize against these powerful flower growers' interests and to free the prisoners? Well, I also want to point out that the person who died when he was alive, he was a close friend of the governor of the state of Mexico at the time, Arturo Montiel. That's where all the government prosecution and the crackdowns in the community came from. Mm. So there's there's little pr revenge there as well. For this, the the crackdown came down hard because of this relationship. Look, the community, as you mentioned it, and the repression that was so intense at the time from the government, they would come into any house, and if they thought that someone they were looking for was there, like maybe Pedro or Lorenzo or Marco Antonio or Romulo or even my sister, they will just went to random houses, they went inside with rifles, whether or not the people they were looking for were there. Whoever was there, they made everyone get out of the house, they dragged children out of their houses at two, three o'clock in the morning to find out if the people they were looking for were there. When they went to Romulo's house, they beat, beat his father savagely. They knocked his teeth out, and he got very sick after that. And regrettably, he even died after that. And I think everyone, in the case of my sister, it was a real blow for my mother because she was already very old at that time and when they dragged her out barely dressed, they took my mother and father, my wife, my children. It was a complete catastrophe. They didn't even bother asking us, is she here? Is he here? Where are you hiding her? Search the house. And well, in the case of my sister, when she was arrested, there was, uh, in the house, there were three or four police officers, every two meters, and they were pointing high-powered rifles at us, all of them with their faces covered. They never showed us an arrest warrant. It was just, oh, we come for her, and there she is. They never said, you know what, this is what's going on with your sister, this is what's happening. No, never. So they came into our house arbitrarily, they jumped over the fence, they acted like criminals because they went into private property without, without anything stopping them. Have there been any investigations of the crimes of the authorities against community members? 
acts? No, because after there was so much government repression uh, from the community, the community started to divide and uh, in the sense that some people thought, well, if they can just come in and arrest people whenever they want, imagine how scared the people were. They couldn't do what they needed to do to continue their lives. But we know that they said that time cures all wounds, and we started to organize and gather again as a community. And today we're stronger than we ever have been. And the proof is that we uh, go around knocking on doors everywhere. We know that the justice system in Mexico is corrupt, but we have a hope that we will be able to do many things because not every person is corrupt. Just because a government uh, was like that at the time doesn't mean that everyone else, and we hope there will be a change, and we've seen a change because in the last election, the Mexican people expressed his desire for change. Have you, what have you done in terms of pressuring the government to look into this case? The Seferino Ladrillero Human Rights Center, whose president is Antonio Lara Duque, it's uh, our representative for this case. He and he has this team of workers. They work so hard to help us. And since they took over the case, we've been able to see the process very clearly. And that's because he's taught us how to go forward, how to stand up straight and say, if they who are in jail don't give up, you who are outside have no reason to give up. We've gone to forums, we've participated in marches, many people in social networks have supported us, artists, uh, non-governmental organizations, former political prisoners have joined our case, and and we have such a big response from the Mexican people who have seen everything we've done in social media for a while back uh, up until now. And, well, these people have given us enough power to keep fighting. And also through other media like yours, Laura, that allows us to get our message uh, out about the problems that our community is facing. This is how people are supporting us, are protecting us, you could say, so that we can have the strength we need and can keep our families unified so we can attack the government from a position of strength. And, and how has your sister been holding up in prison? You know, how have the prisoners been able to, to confront this situation of injustice on a daily basis, what gives them strength? The strength that they have is that we on the outside have done everything we can, as I told you, and through that they have seen, they have the strength that in spite of still being locked up in there, where they are totally limited in terms of being able to go out and say, we are innocent, and we are their voice. We are, uh, we stand up for them, and we say what they feel there inside of prison. We reflect it towards people like you, toward people who have seen us, uh, have seen our struggle, uh, have seen our demonstrations on the roadblocks, and everything that we've done. It's as if they, through us, are telling us what we need to know up to go forward. In your struggle, you talk about the defense of water being the defense of life. Uh, why, why do you call it that? What's the basis of the fight that you're fighting right now besides the freedom of the, of the political prisoners? We say that water is life because for us, the, our community, if we don't have water, like any other citizen without water, basically we would die. Because, well, for, for example, our ancestors, our forefathers used to say, we can live two or three days without eating, but we cannot live two or three days without water. 
That's why water is life. That's why we defend water. We have to fight for it because now we are fighting for it, not just for ourselves, but also for our children, our grandchildren, and for future generations to come. Because it's not just about saying that all at this moment we want to be able to drink water, but also we want to use our waters to be able to make our agricultural projects. Uh, but the agriculture isn't just for us, because we grow corn, we grow beans, we grow fava beans, potatoes, but for us, we still exchange things with other people. For example, when you have corn, I have potatoes, I'll give you potatoes in exchange for corn. If I have fava beans, I'll give you fava beans and you give me corn. Or the other way around. Like you have potatoes, I have fava. Let's change. And the flowers that they're producing, the large growers in the nearby village, what happens to those flowers? Are they exporting them? All of the flowers that they produce, the, that all goes to exports. None of it stays in Mexico. You could say it's a lucrative business for them because everything they produce, it all goes to other countries, everything. The problem is that, well, the small, the small producers of Villa Guerrero, you know, and the other neighboring villages, they don't fight with us. Why? Because they have their own water. The ones who fight against us are the big businesses that are obviously protected by the government. And this government, I'll say it again, ever since and all the time that the Atlacomulco group has been uh, governing here, because unfortunately that's the way it is, there's an unbroken chain of power here. They haven't left the power. The father, the son, the grandson, the nephew, the cousin, all of them have been relatives that have been governors here in the state of Mexico. It's a um, mafia. It's as simple as that. That's what Erubiel Avila did. He said, adopt me so you can be your political son. So that's the only way some, someone who isn't part of the Tlacomulco group can hold power in the state of Mexico. Any one of them, Laura, you can investigate any one of them. And you'll see that all of them are relatives of the same group. Yeah. Roberto, you were talking about how you've had more support and the, the, the village is more united in this fight and they've been able to reach out to gain support from other people. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, you had a gathering that was in defense of land, in defense of water, and to free political prisoners. Tell us about what happened at that gathering. Well, look, at that meeting we had support from so many people, more than 65 different organizations at the national level, and international ones too. And there were people from Costa Rica, Colombia, people who you would never expect people from other countries to come and give you a hand, to say, you know what, we are with you. Don't give up. You can do it. That's one more thing that keeps us going. As the families of the six people who are in, in jail, that gives us the strength to keep fighting for them. As you said, to fight for our water, like I said, because water is life, and to free our prisoners for Dominga, for Romulo, for Teófilo, for Marco Antonio, for Lorenzo and Pedro, they aren't criminals. They were criminalized, which is different. The government accused them of something that they never did, and they never accepted it. Why do you think these other organizations felt this call to come and stand beside you. Did you find that they're fighting similar battles? Well, yeah, because they are, there are also former political prisoners who came, people who had the same experience firsthand. For example, people from the Mexicali Resiste uh, were there. Mm -hmm. Also a water battle. Yes, they were there supporting us completely. And other people, people whose names I don't remember right now, other people who were also former political prisoners and from communities who were going through the same thing, suffering dispossession by the federal government. I think that it's not, it's not just that we're saying this is happening. 
I think that the whole population of Mexico knows that this government we have now with Enrique Peña Nieto, they want to privatize things that don't belong to, to, to them. Because in fact, the water doesn't belong to them. It belongs to every Mexican, and he wants to give it to the businessmen on a silver platter, so that we, the Mexican people, will be left without, without anything. Roberto, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the show, and I want to wish you a lot of success in your fight for justice in the case of your sister Dominga and the other political prisoners, and the longer-term, all-important battle for the rights to land and water here in Mexico. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks to you, to your audience. Believe me that this is something that motivates us to keep going, to keep fighting for our prisoners to be free. So please receive our very sincere gratitude from the sound of San Pedro Tranisco. And from us, the families of the people who are locked up there, Unfairly, Pedro, as I told you, Teófilo, Pedro, Lorenzo, Teófilo, Romulo, Lorenzo, Romulo, Dominga, Dominga todos ellos, all of them, en mío, en de todas in my name, and in the name of all our families, we sincerely thank you for the opportunity that you have given us that will allow people to learn about this case, and people will be able to join us and support us. And believe me, when someone talks to you and says, we're with you, that gives us strength to keep fighting. It gives us strength to fight. It gives us strength and energy to say that we are not alone, that there are lots of people behind us who, in one way or another, are supporting us. And as you said earlier, the proof is in the great response we got during this forum we held in the community from so many organizations, both national and international organizations. They supported us and they still do. So just to finish, I want to thank you again and tell you that right now we are working on an appeal for the three people who were sentenced last November to 50 years of jail. Well, thanks again. It's been a real privilege to talk to you. And thank you for watching. We'll be back next week on Interviews from Mexico. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is from the south, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez.